Good afternoon. We're here to honor the memory of Rose Young. And uh, there's a request that I have. Some of you are thinking this as well. And those of you who aren't thinking this, uh, you might have a rude awakening, cell phones. Now, uh, cell phones uh, have a way of interrupting at uh, kind of the worst moments, you know. But if you turn off your cell phone now, I want you also to remember to turn it on because you are seeing people and you're saying, I've lost your contact and we need to get together. Or we, would you send pictures my way or will you? On and on it goes. And so those cell phones can be a blessing after this service and we just encourage you to make the most of the special relationships we have here today. Thankful to have you here. This was Rose's church. She and Bill put a lot into this uh, and uh, used to be University Avenue for many years and then the move here to this uh, location and Rose was a part of it all. Let's pray and ask God to be especially near to us today. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this privilege. And as Bill just said it a few moments ago, to celebrate. <laughs> Rose is celebrating right now, so we might as well join her. She is with her Savior, Jesus, face to face. And we anticipate that day, but right now we want to honor Rose's life. Thank you for her and all that she has meant to each of these. And as we learn more about her, learn about her life, may it encourage us and challenge us to serve you as well. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
I've been asked to read the eulogy. Most of you will have that in front of you. But uh, the service is being live streamed, and so many are watching, and we're thankful that we can do that through technology. I might add a comment or two as I read this, because uh, the young family was uh, very much a part of, of my upgrowing, and uh, good to establish a connection with Harold again. We used to run the hills of Camp Pine Rock before it was named Camp Pine Camp Pine Rock, but uh, let me just read this. Rosemary passed away peacefully at the age of 90. She was born in Scottsdale, Arizona to John and Rosalie Hardison. She grew up with three brothers, Bill, Charlie, and Johnny. Now, a number of years ago, I had the privilege of uh, editing and publishing a, a book or helping Charlie uh, uh, published this book about uh, Johnny, uh, Rose's brother. She told me I got a lot of the stories wrong <laughs> and that she had a different perspective and memory of some of the events. The family moved to Phoenix where she graduated from Phoenix North High. After gradu graduation, she went to work for the telephone company. She attended Phoenix Eastside Church of the Nazarene where she was very active as a teen in the leadership and planning for teenage programs and activities. Rose was talented in so many ways. She loved sewing, and you'll see some illustrations, some evidence of that over here, making her own clothes as a teen, then as an adult for herself and the whole family. This led to an embroidery machine, then a knitting machine for Afghans and more. She loved working in the yard and definitely had a green thumb. She loved decorating the house, turning it into a warm, welcoming home. She was an avid reader, thus her love for the Mission Church Resource Center. In 1979, she put together the Resource Center at University Avenue Church of the Nazarene. When the church moved to the present location with a new name and a new building, she was asked to set up a new resource center where she spent countless hours. Last but not least, while Bill was a pastor, she embraced the parsonage with grace as a friend to all and a tireless worker. She married William Bill Young on November 24th, 1951. Last year, they celebrated their 72nd anniversary. Now, when I was growing up, my sisters didn't talk about Bill. They talked about Willie. <laughs> she helped raise four children, Mike, Doug, Tim, and Cindy. There were nine grandchildren and two greats with one on the way. She really believed in prayer, evidenced by the fact you're here today. While Parkinson's and scoliosis showed her uh, presence uh, outside the home, she was the go-to prayer warrior for family and friends. When a need arose, the call came to her in person or by phone. Other times, she just felt a need without a request, and prayer commenced not later, but right now, in faith believing. I wonder which ones of us are going to take up that mantle of prayer.
Thank you for coming. Appreciate it so much. And a lot of surprise ones, too, for which I'm thankful. First, I want to let you know that uh, I appreciate each of you that taken the time to be here today. The song that was sung was sung at our wedding. And as you hear what we're going to say now, you'll understand how it was prophecy as much as anything else. My remembrances of Rose so how did we get here? Well, it all began in 1949 when I graduated from Scottsdale High School. 
Dr. M. L. Mann, the Arizona District Superintendent, offered summer work at the district campgrounds, Pine Rock, if you've heard about, in Prescott, Arizona, to get ready for camp meeting. At the end of the summer job, I was offered a new job to, <coughs> to uh, work in the snack shack uh, for the rest of the summer. And you have to remember, Prescott is 5,000 feet, cool. Phoenix, low, 100 degrees. You can see why I stayed. <laughs> so many people stayed in cabins at the campground. Others, they, they um, uh, had uh, cabins. We had a cabin. Harold and uh, Paul used to play underneath it. It had an area that was kind of fun. And so that was kind of a nice uh, part of uh, Camp Pine Rock as well. So I was offered this job in the snack shack. And what happened next was a group of young, what happened, the people would come and go, uh, but they always come up for the big Sunday service. So a group of young people drove up from Phoenix Eastside Church of the Nazarene, standing in front of me at the snack shack, ordering some ice cream, was a beautiful, young, blonde teenager. Wow, I just got to meet her. What was her name? I where did she li live, I asked. She replied, Rosemary Hardison in Phoenix. Great. Here it comes. I'm Willie, <laughs> just in case all the rest of you like Bill. <laughs> I live in Phoenix, too. Maybe we could get together. That was the first of several cold shoulders. <laughs> but I would not be deterred. Back in Phoenix... She got off the bus from North High School right in front of A.J. Bayless Markets where I worked. I asked her out, but no luck. I remember she went to Eastside Church. I attended Phoenix First Church. New plan. <laughs> I started attending Eastside Church. <laughs> There's a whole lot more to this story, and if you talk to me individually, I can fill in some of the blanks. But this, I fi we finally had our first date, and it grew into love, and it grew into marriage. So, Arizona had a law, Rosalie always told us, if you ask her about our marriage, she loved to tell this story. Arizona had a law that females could get married at 18. That's because they're already mature. However, Males could not marry until 21. I was only 20. So I had to go and have my mom sign it okay to get married. <laughs> she loved to tell that story. Marriage was good. We both had jobs, a nice apartment where Rose began to show one of her talents for decorating. We attended church regularly as good laymen. Another talent shown through she was really a good cook. Each day we began with scripture and prayer. Our love grew as we enjoyed family, friends, activities together. But this was about to change. One day on my way to work, I was overcome with the feeling that God was present. I pulled the car over to the side of the road and prayed. I told Rose about it, and she confirmed that she felt that same kind of a thing uh, away from me. Right, right then, we pledged to pray each day until we understood what God wanted us to do. While on our knees before our couch, that is when I discovered that Rose was a prayer warrior. And many of you received her prayers, I'll tell you for sure. After about a week, answer came. God had a plan for our life together, enter into ministry. It was so clear that, to both of us that we answered yes, and immediately we began to fulfill the call. What did that look like? No preachers in our family, never thought about it, never. I had a different career. We needed to prepare to answer the call by going to Pasadena College, now Point Loma Nazarene University in California. We quit our jobs, sold our car, too many payments, and 
put our furniture in my parents' garage, ready to move. At the same time, our best friend, Bob and Tommy Lou Kelly, were getting, going to get married, go to Pasadena College to prepare for ministry. So we asked, because we did not have a car, if we could go with them. Talk about best friends. We went with them on their honeymoon. <laughs> and it gets better. They were really a good planners. And they already had an apartment there. So when we arrived in Pasadena, we moved in with them. <laughs> now Rose is the kind of person that likes to have things uh, for other people. She cares about other people, all these things. And so she, she's thinking of others, and she said, we need to get our own place. I said, I've been looking, nothing yet. Our budget is $35 a month. I said, we will find our place today. Rose would pray as I looked. With confidence in her prayer, I walked up Hill Street, saw a phone booth, went in, opened the yellow pages, two apartments, closed my eyes, moved my finger down the page, stopped, called the number. I asked, do you have an apartment for rent? Yes, was the reply. How much is the rent? $35 a month. Thank you, Lord. Where is it located? Tell me where you are. I'm at the corner of Hill and Washington Street in the phone booth. The reply was, just walk next door. It was, uh, it was our miracle. It wasn't a mansion. It was two rooms, kitchen and living room in the daytime, nighttime, bedroom. We bought a hide a bed so we could have a couch and also have a bed. Tell me where you are, I said, next door. <clears throat> it, as I said, not a mansion, but it was our answer to prayer. It is within walking distance, this was important, walking distance to Pasadena College. So Rose put her skills to work and turned an apartment into a home. Rose found a job in a vinyl record pressing plant. I know I'm talking a foreign language for some of you. Telephone booth, yellow pages, vinyl records. But listen, it was in the 50s. You were in board, some of you. <laughs> so <clears throat> later, I found a job at the Market Basket grocery store. College days were great and challenging. I can't tell you all the things that was going on. Two of our children, Mike and Douglas, were born during that time. Another strength came evident. Rose was a wonderful mother to go along with her many other talents. I graduated in 1956, and we were off to our first pastorate, Flagstaff, Arizona. The church was just opened up after being closed. God does have a sense of humor. The church building was a converted barn, and the parsonage was attached. It was attached to the sanctuary. And you know what would be in the think tanks? That's where the animals were kept originally. So there we are. And uh, the rooms were attached. Now, this is important. No complaint from Rose. Just like Pasadena all over again, it's our home. I will share one funny story. Sunday dinner was always roast beef, potatoes, carrots in the big iron skillet put in the oven before church. Towards the end of my sermon, the aroma started coming from the parsonage into the sanctuary, and I knew it was time to quit. <laughs> Timothy was born in Flagstaff, and uh, 
um, Rose was pregnant with Cindy. And while Cindy was, and while Rose was visiting her mother down in Phoenix, Cindy came two months early. Our next uh, pastorate was Yuma, Arizona. I went from 7,000 feet to 213 feet. I went from beautiful, cool weather to if it got 100 at night, we were, we were okay. She was firmly established as queen of the parsonage. It was a wonderful house with three bedrooms, air conditioning, next door to the church. That was important to me. So no more Sunday aroma from the parsonage drifting in during the sermon. She was raising four children, taught Sunday school, and had to be a friend to all. Entertaining guests, and much more, but she was always a friend to everyone. Rose was so happy during our time in Yuma. A call came from a church in Dexter, Missouri. Well, the district superintendent called asking us to come as pastor. I told Rose that I don't think we should go and I'll tell him no. The DS called again and asked us to pray about it. And I said we would. When I hung up, Rose said, what happened to no? <laughs> then as before, we sought God's will and prayer, and it was clear we needed to move to Missouri. It was sad to leave Yuma, but we knew it was God's direction. Moving from California and Arizona to the boot heel of Missouri was a culture shock. <laughs> we were told that sometimes Newcomers were not accepted right away in that part of the country. So, interestingly, <laughs> this kind of caught me there for a moment. Interesting, uh, Rose was to the rescue. How did that happen? We found she had roots just a few miles away from where this Dexter church was. And the, her grandpa lived there. And on top of that, the house was still there. And you could go by and see it all the time. Problem solved. We were accepted. Now a new call came challenging, changing the direction of ministry for Rose. The International Headquarters Church of Nazarene in Kansas City, Missouri, asked me to come and serve as general director of Caravan Junior Fellowship. Now... There would be no more parsonage to care for, no longer a pastor's wife. However, still the mother of four children. <laughs> That's enough. We rented a hundred-year-old house from the general church that needed a lot of fixing up. She was up for the task. She went to work also in the Christian bookstore at headquarters. This led her to start a library at St. Paul's Church of the Nazarene where we attended. Our final chapter of ministry was the move back to California in 1979 to be part of Point Loma College, now Point Loma Nazarene University. My position required a lot of travel. So, one of the, a lot of travel. Uh, so Rose, I told her, you choose the church where we're gonna go because I'll be gone a lot. After visiting a few churches, she chose University Church of the Nazarene with Reverend Tom Goble as pastor, which by coincidence was Rose's classmate at North High School in Phoenix. Also, Tom was part of four young men called the ministry from Phoenix First, and I was one of those. We were classmates at Pasadena. We graduated together in 56, and we both returned to Arizona for our first churches. Right away, Rose went into action to start a resource center at University Church. When the church moved to this location, Tom gave her the assignment for the resource center here. I retired from PLNU in 1997. 
This was the year Rose was diagnosed with Parkinson's. It did not, it did not slow her down at first, and you'll see that from the slides. But later, scoliosis set in, and uh, it turned uh, in 2020 that uh, she went downhill quite a bit. And so I became a caregiver with help from Cindy and Tim, as well as Nurse Emerald Roundtree. So we filled the scripture that says, two will become one. We kept our marriage vows, love and cherish, for richer and poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. May the love of my life rest in peace. Thanks be to God.
Good afternoon. My name is Gordon. Um, I get the great privilege to be the pastor here at Mission Church and Bill and Rose's pastor for the last three years. And to the family, I'd like to share a passage of scripture for you in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And may God's grace be your source of peace and comfort. I want to thank uh, Bill for um, just taking the opportunity to help me understand what a phone booth and yellow pages are, <laughs> as well as what is that phonograph record? Um, it has been um, a great journey to be the pastor of this church for the last three years. And, and in that time, I uh, got the opportunity to visit with Bill and Rose. And uh, sadly, in, the, in those three years that I've been in the pastor of, of this church, um, I've only got to interact with Rose in your home and the times that I did. And, um, and in those times... There's several things that uh, I've come to know, and one of them is Rose's great love for the Lord and her sincere belief that one thing was certain, that Jesus was her Savior and her Lord, and that because of her faith, and really the faith that we all share today, this assures us that eternal life truly is hers. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 says this, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. There's certainty there. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Rose knew this. Praise the Lord. And her confidence in Jesus was something that she was assured of. And I know that many of you knew Rose for quite some time, much longer than I have, gotten to know Rose over the past three years. And um, you saw the pictures of the resource center and the library. Rose was especially concerned in one of the visits that I had with her while we were sitting in your living room. She told me about her part in helping that library come to pass here at Mission Church. And, and her concern was that it be a resource for the children and for the young families so that these children and young families would have access to the resources that told them about Jesus. And that was Rose's heart, beautifully, that, uh, that, G that people would know about Jesus, especially the children and the church. And so after Rose's passing, I sat down with Bill because I wanted to know more about Rose and, and in the story, the, your, your, what you shared today, Bill, was a lot of what uh, I, I learned about Rose, how they met, her other interests. And, and after hearing about Rose, I, I, I was assured that had I gotten to, know Ro gotten to know Rose sooner, that Rose and I would be like this. Because so much of her interests are the interests that I share as well. I feel like Rose and I would be best friends. You say that Rose was a prayer warrior. And um, prayer is a passion of mine here at this church. And I know that uh, of all of the things that, that we consider so important, that prayer would be elevated and she would be there at all of those times where we gathered to pray here at Mission Church. Another thing you said about Rose is that she loves to cook. And that is a passion of mine as well too. So much so that when I was younger, I have a degree in culinary arts and I, I bet we could share recipes and enjoy the whole aspect of cooking. Third, Rose loved Jesus. And that's another passion of my heart to love the Lord with all of our hearts, and, um, and to serve him. And so all these things Rose was so amazing at, um, and, 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 and that we shared the same pas passion. But the fourth thing that Bill told me was that Rose implemented the Dewey Decimal System here in the church library. And so I thought, well, three out of four things isn't too bad. <laughs> 
One other thing about Rose was that she was a gentle spirit. B Bill said that um, when discipline needed to happen, she would always tell the children, well, you have to wait till your dad comes home, right? <laughs> kind of like in my family too, right? I'm, I'm the gentle spirit. And um, <laughs> Rochelle is the hard disciplinarian, like Bill. You and Rochelle share the same heart there. Um, Rose's gentle spirit reminds me of the beautiful passage of uh, Psalm 23. And, the, the, you know, whenever you think of gentleness, you think of a, a lamb. And on the back of your program is the 23rd Psalm. And I'd love to invite you to read along with me our passage for today. Let's read together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He make me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. The 23rd Psalm beautifully describes the relationship between a sheep and its shepherd. And, you know, we read this psalm quite a bit, and sometimes it gets so um, comfortable to us that we miss some of the nuances of this passage of Scripture. But let me ask you this question. Have you ever noticed that the 23rd Psalm was written from the perspective of a sheep looking at its shepherd? That verse, the first line, first, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. As King David, who wrote this psalm, writes it, he, he writes it from the perspective of a sheep looking at its shepherd. And, and if you know your Bible, as I'm sure most of you do here, you know that this King David, um, his first job was tending sheep. He was a shepherd. So when King David writes this beautiful psalm, it is through the personal experience of working closely with sheep, but also through his personal experience of living out his faith with God as his shepherd. And this is what King David says as he writes in this psalm about when the Lord is your shepherd. He says, you, you shall not be in want, which means you, you, you won't lack for anything. And when the Lord is your shepherd, he makes you lie down in green pastures and he leads you beside still waters. There's a peace that can only come in this world, when you know the shepherd, that Jesus is your shepherd. And when the Lord is your shepherd, it says that he restores your soul. And when the Lord is your shepherd, he leads you in paths of righteousness for his namesake. And I couldn't help but sit just listening to you, Bill, as you shared about allowing the shepherd to lead you and Rose through the many different paths that you have chosen to follow him. And I hear, I heard in your story that all of these things that were written in the 23rd Psalm was your story as you have faithfully followed the Lord. You and Rose faithfully followed the Lord. And here in the 23rd Psalm, there's a beautiful shift in verse 4, that is so subtle, yet so profound. The psalm becomes something personal between the sheep and the shepherd in verse 4. When the, when the psalm began, the shepherd was addressing, uh, when the psalm began, the shepherd was addressed in the second person, right? The Lord is my shepherd. 
But in verse 4, I don't know if you notice the subtle transition and the shift. The shepherd changes from the second person to the first person. And the writer of this psalm says, Yo, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That's that beautiful transition. It becomes so personal. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So this beautiful transition, this shift comes to make the psalm something of beauty in the personal perspective of more than just a, a, a sheep looking at its shepherd, it moves beyond that, addressing God as Lord and the personal relationship and experience, this intimate relationship that a person can have with God. And sheep, I'm not sure if you've been around them too often. I have not, but I've seen them in barns and at the zoo, and, and as I've read about them, they're they're, they are defenseless animals, right? They're not known to be fighters. When they are threatened, they stiffen up and they fall down and they play dead. The only thing that are afraid of sheep are green blades of grass. <laughs> and there are many predators in this world out to get defenseless, delicious sheep. But I love the confidence of the sheep in the 23rd Psalm. Yea, Though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That is the confidence that we have as we walk through life with Jesus as our shepherd. And in the final hours of Rosa's life, as she walked through this very valley that's spoken of here in the psalm, Jesus walked with her. And it was Jesus and his rod and his staff that guided her and comforted her. And Rose tasted the goodness and mercy. And now she is dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. Praise the Lord. And I love the beauty of looking at the Lord as our shepherd through the 23rd Psalm through the eyes of a sheep. But there's another passage of scripture that I'd like to share with you today. And it's the perspective of looking through the eyes of the shepherd as he looks upon his sheep. That passage is found in John chapter 10. And uh, if you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. I ask that the uh, passages uh, be put on the screen as we read this passage together. From John chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, Jesus says these words, I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep and am, and am known by my own. And as my father knows me, even so I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Mm. I call John 10 the New Testament 23rd Psalm, but only through the perspective of the shepherd instead. Jesus goes on to say in verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and my Father. So whenever I'm asked to share a message at a memorial service or celebration of life service, it's one thing that I understand very clearly, and that is this. While this service is here to honor and to remember Rose, and we, we did that well, we celebrate her life. That's what Bill's um, request was with, when we gathered together as a family. We remember through the memories and the stories, we honored Rose. 
But going forward, know this, that this message wasn't written for Rose. This service is really for you and for me, right? Rose is gone. She's, she's with the Lord in heaven. This service is for us. And this message is for you. To know that as we look to Jesus to be our shepherd, he looks to us to be his sheep. And going forward, what will ultimately honor the life of Rose is for those that she loved, her ohana, her family, for all of her friends and neighbors that are here, for you to know Christ Jesus as your shepherd in your heart, the same way Rose knew Jesus as her shepherd. And I believe the same thing that Rose believed that one day, just as Rose is in heaven, that I will see her again, just as you will. And I'll see my dad again, who passed away seven and a half years ago. And all who follow Jesus that have gone before us, we get the great privilege to know without doubt, with cer certainty, that as Jesus Christ is our Savior, our Lord, our Shepherd, that we shall see those once again who believe in the same way. I love how John 10, 27 says this, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. That's ours, as we follow Jesus. And that's my prayer for us today, to not ignore the word that is shared with you, either written or spoken, and that we sincerely seek to be known by our shepherd and to know the shepherd and to allow that shepherd to lead our lives in the way that we should go. I love your story. I love the journey that Christ has taken you on. And to know that he is with us no matter where we go. He's never out of reach. So, in closing, the last thing I want to do is end by looking at how we ended the passage there in John chapter 10 when Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And one of the strongest themes in the entire Bible is this theme of unity, of Jesus and God being one. And for us to live in unity in many different ways, in the unity of the message of what saves us, in the unity of the peace that Jesus came to bring, when we are united, we are strongest because we have one another to lean on. And I'm so grateful that we get that chance to do that together. And when Jesus says, I am my Father, I and my Father are one, it's to let us know that just as we follow Jesus, we also need to seek unity with him. And so today we're unified in our grief, in our mourning, in our loss, but we're also unified in the fact of knowing that Rose is in the presence of God. And if we are unified with God and his plan for our lives, we will also see Rose again. And I rejoice in that. So let us close this time with a prayer of unity and join our hearts together as one. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, thank you for your son Jesus, our shepherd. A shepherd that leads and guides and protects. Our shepherd that knows us and our shepherd that desires for us to know him fully. And I pray today that as the shepherd leads, that each of us may follow. And I pray that that unifies our hearts, not only with you, but with one another. That we would live lives of unity together, journeying with one another, seeking you and knowing you with all of our hearts, that we can share in the certainty that this gift of eternal life was given, is given to us as it has been given to those who have gone before us. 
So thank you, Lord God, for giving us that beautiful message today. And may that unity continue to lead us forward together as we seek to serve you with all of our hearts. And it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm the daughter, Cindy. I'm the baby. Um, thank you, thank you for coming. Um, my mom, oh, how I miss my mom. I love her. She was my mother, my confidant, my prayer warrior, my encourager, my friend, my seamstress, my babysitter, my teacher, and so much more a mom could be. There are so many memories I would love to share with you, but that would take days. However, there are a few. I had the privilege the last four months, I mean, four years, not four months, four years spending every Sunday with my mom, usually 9.30 to 3.30. Then my brother Tim would come and spend time with my mom until my dad got home at six. For the first few years, my mom and I would sit in the living room. I'd turn on the TV, I'd cue in the YouTube for Mission Church of the Nazarene, so we could be part of the church service. <laughs> it was a special time. Mind you, there were times I would get everything cued in and then my mom would say, I can't hear it. I'd turn up the volume, then it was, I still can't hear it, turn it up. That made me laugh. My mom was determined to let me know she wanted to hear it even though it was hurting my ears. I would just move to the other side of the living room. Then do you know what she would say? I can't see you. <laughs> so cute. My mom had so many talents. One of her biggest ones was a, as a seamstress. She would spend hours sewing for us. I remember in our Raytown, Missouri house, she had this little sewing room downstairs in the garage. It had her Bernina sewing machine, a washer, a dryer, an ironing board, shelling on one wall that held these little gold tubs um, where mom would put all our clean laundry. She did all our laundry. And if we didn't come down there and pick up that gold tub, take it to our room, she'd march us down there to get that gold tub, go put it away. She sewed the curtains for the house, made tablecloths, napkins, sewed all my clothes, all my Barbie doll clothes, and even my winter coat. I loved that coat. It was brown looking leather, long down to my knees. She added a leopard cuffs and leopard collar. I thought I was the coolest kid in town. I remember one year my mom made my dad brothers matching suits with vests and ties. And then she made her and I matching outfits. Oh, how I wish I had that talent had worn off on me. And I think that that's where I got, I had to match my family all the time in the same color, the same outfits. And where's my son? Um, and I always had him in a turtleneck that <laughs> to this day, <laughs> you know, because we all wore turtlenecks and not anymore. Um, I did try and I can sew a little bit but nothing like her. When she moved to San Diego, mom picked up the embroidery and knitting talent. She loved to do both. I tried to capture that in the slide presentation along with the display um, here on stage. She loved knitting afghans, pillows, sweaters, making baby towels, bibs, aprons as gifts for people. This truly was her ministry. But you know what? My mom's greatest talent ministry was being a prayer warrior, a friend. There wasn't a day that my mom wouldn't be praying for something or someone, especially her family. There were many a day and night that my mom would receive a call from me in tears with my life upside down. I'd be crying so hard that it would take that gentle voice of my mom to call me and say, it's going to be okay. I'm um, I'm going to be praying. 
just bring it before the Lord, Cindy. I admired her strength and the way she showed her love to anyone and everyone in her last days here on earth. And if you didn't notice, at the doors, there's little Kleenex packages for each of you um, that say, always pray and never give up. This, my friends, was my mom, always praying and never giving up. My mom loved the Lord, her family, her church, and her friends, and was ready to pray morning, noon, and night. I would love to think that I've learned these traits from my mom, that I will be able to pass them on to my family. Should any one of you here today need a friend or a prayer, just let me know. I'm here for you. I thought I was going to do better than this. Wow. Thanks. Thanks for coming. I'm supposed to be the one to speak for my brothers. I, oh, by the way, I'm number three. <laughs> That's what I'd always say is uh, number three is home or hello, this is number three. Sometimes when I'd call home or talk to my mom or dad, I would say, oh, hey, did you talk to your oldest brother's daughter or sister, oldest brother's sister, just to try to confuse people. So thanks for coming. It's so good to see everybody that's come. So I had this plan, and it's all fallen apart because everybody's taken my little lines that I had written out here. The pastor took it. Dad took them. But well, we're going to do them anyway. Um, so, the phrase, wait till your father gets home, didn't originate with the TV show. There was one. My mom would say that often, going down the hallway, wait till your father gets home. Another phrase, all right, who got hurt this time? <laughs> Doug and I shared the same room, and there was conflict. Uh, He hit me one time only because I hit him first. And uh, mom would say, Mike, leave your brother alone. <laughs> you two stop fighting, Tim and Cindy. Or when mom was really frustrated and she needed to uh, call me out on something, this is the phrase that she would say, Mike, Doug, Cindy, Stormy, the dog, Tim, Timothy, get in here. She would manage to call at everyone and then remember that my name was Tim. <laughs> Mom would often say, let's get together, let's get the prayer circle going. As we've all heard from dad, from mom, from the pastor. So I was fortunate. Well, let me, let me back up a little bit more. Um, the sewing room is the theme. We always had the sewing room. I spent quite a few hours sitting there in the chair. So you don't want to go to sleep? Okay, sit there and wait. Oh, 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 open your eyes. You didn't want to sleep. My mom would sew late at night. She would iron the clothes late at night. She was always up late. And I remember those days. Um, I remember, and, and it was something that Doug and Mike mentioned to me that, and Cindy remembers too, we would go to the fabric store and she would pull out patterns, put patterns over our bodies to make sure the pattern was long enough uh, to fit us. And then we would pick the style that we wanted and she would bring it home and make a suit. She made one for Doug that he's worn, that he did wear for a long time. He made stuff for Mike. She made, as you saw some of the pictures, she made matching clothes and we had these little vests when we were in uh, Yuma and they had pockets here and they had pockets on the inside and I could put those pockets full of toys, of course, which we 
require the frisking of our bodies before we would go into church. They were wooden pews and cars were not quiet rolling on the wooden pews. I remembered a time, I don't know if Doug does, but Doug and I decided we needed to build a lemonade stand while we were in Yuma, Arizona. And uh, uh, as we were trying to make it, I pulled out the saw and I was gonna cut a board and I managed to miss the board and cut between my large toe and my middle toe and create such a wonderful cut that they had to take me to the hospital to get some stitches. Mom was not very happy with that. And in the following years, a gray swatch would begin to show in her hair. She would often blame it on me. <laughs> Mom's hair continued to turn gray as we moved to Kansas City, from Dexter to Kansas City. Mike fell out of the hayloft onto the Galaxy 500 Ford, and that required another hospitalization. It was a very difficult time for Mike, he had, uh, he had uh, a very hurt neck, for lack of better grammar. But he also had managed to own a Kawasaki 500 and decided that he was going to go on a drive. And uh, the sun started setting, and Mike can't see well at night. So he had to pull off the highway and kind of tucked in some bushes. And he spent the night there until morning. Mom prayed. I remember mom praying quite a bit for that day, for that night, until Mike was able to get home. Mike also had to battle a tablecloth down in, the, uh, in his room, which was the family room where the fireplace was. That's where he lived in Raytown. He managed to pull out a shotgun and kill that tablecloth with table salt. My mom... Because she was such a good seamstress, she managed to pull out some other cloth that was similar to what was the tablecloth and patched it perfectly. The only thing that didn't get taken care of was the salt that was embedded in the wall paneling. Doug and I, we, we did a lot of things together. We're a bit closer in age. We shared the same room. Uh, we were out playing football, sort of, alongside the house. Doug reached up to catch the football and it hit his pinky finger and dislocated it and sent it sideways. That was kind of about the last time mom could handle seeing our, our, our tears, our cracks, our blood and guts and other fun stuff. So uh, later, Doug decided that it was time to cut his finger on a table saw. Mom's hair continued to get gray. Part of things that uh, my mom and dad let us have was a chemistry set. So we set about trying to burn wasps with right guard and a lighter. We also tried to make gunpowder and set firecrackers off in the bedroom. That wasn't Doug. <laughs> we had microscope sets and erector sets, painting. Mom made sure that we tried to be as well-rounded at different things as possible. But through all of that theme, there was always prayer. Um, the pot roast every Sunday would float through our house. We'd so look forward to getting home after church, long-winded pastors. and you could just smell that pot roast. We knew what we were looking forward to. As mom kind of aged and, and was having trouble, um, I remember one time we were at the airport uh, seeing mom and dad off for a, a trip they were going on and uh, something happened. I don't recall exactly, but mom just kind of tumbled to the floor, to the ground. And one of the things that she says is, I've learned how to fall gracefully. It's just a couple of things I want to add. I've been so blessed. 
by both my mom and dad. Mom wouldn't be mom without dad. Dad definitely wouldn't be without mom. In all of the years that have unfolded from all of us kids doing the things that we do and have done and the choices we've made and not all of them have been good choices, more so on my part than my brother's. Mom always demonstrated a great amount of forgiveness. We never felt, or at least in conversation with them, we never felt diminished, condemned, um, not reminded about our choices. She always just loved us, wanted the best for us, continued to pray for us. But mom was a team with dad and they worked things through. They had discussions about what to do about each one of us. Mom always treated us as individuals, never cookie cutter. She never wanted us to walk uh, in the crowd. Be yourself. Don't follow the crowd. Serve God. Serve Christ. The one thing that I look back on over the years is that this was not a verse that mom ever gave us, but it's a reflection of how our home was run. And that would be Psalm 11930. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. She set God's rules before us. Paraphrased by Tim Young. If it's not for the blood of Christ to cover our sins, we would not be here today in this way. If it wasn't for God's mercy by offering his son that we have propitiation for our sins, for our choices in life that are antithetical to what Christ wants from us. We have that way of forgiveness. We have that way of covering our sins and, and being able to uh, be in the presence of God. My heart is always hurt when I see people who have chosen to reject God's love through the blood of Christ. Because then it makes times like this without Without God's love, without serving Christ, it makes times like this meaningless. Because what is there after this? But for us who believe there is heaven, there is the presence of God, there is the presence of his arms around us. It is his love that gives us a new life and another life. And for those who don't believe and have chosen another path, there is darkness, as the scriptures say. I'm so thankful that both my mom and my dad gave us a home to learn of God's faithfulness and of Christ's love and mostly his forgiveness for our stupid choices and those are my reflections on growing up under my mom. These last few years that I've been able to sit with her and talk with her and reflect on uh, childhood and events, I would come to mom and I would say, uh, well, her head was always tilted sideways because of her scoliosis. So I would lean in and turn my head to match her eyes and say, how are you doing today, Mom? She'd say, well, I'm still alive. And I would reply, are you surprised? 
And then I would ask her, well, what's Jesus saying you, to you today? And one of her phrases to all of us was, well, I better get with it. We've got some praying to do and stuff. She always was, uh, as the theme was, ready to pray with anybody, for anybody. She loved Emerald coming into the house. She was the nurse and felt like um, that that was one of her ministries. We had another lady come to our home. She's here today, and I'm so thankful for her. Her name is Angela. Mom would pray for Angela all the time. I'm so thankful that Angela could be there. She did my mom's fingernails, and that was really nice to see. I miss my mom, sort of. She was in a lot of pain. And it's good to see that she's home, that God has blessed her and given her a time of no pain and a time of just rest and peace. I thank you again for all of you coming today, making the trip up. Hi, Billy. I didn't know that story. That was such a wonderful story, showing me about my mom when she was a younger girl being able to play with Billie Jean, her niece. Last, our cousins are here. All of mom's brothers are gone. There's still family here, Joan and, and uh, Marilyn. Uh, Joan is Charlie's wife, and Marilyn is Johnny's wife. And I was talking to Charlie, my cousin, and... Um, the generations have passed for the Hardisons. And as the pastor, as uh, Paul said, who's going to take up the mantle? Who's going to do the prayer, praying? Who's going to be the warriors? And that's us. It's every one of us who believe that we can be available to the non-believers so that they can be lifted up and find true peace true joy and salvation, a new heart and a new life. I'm thankful for the time I've had with my mom. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. It gives me hope that as I make my poor choices and mistakes, that they're covered. We're going to sing one more song, or we're going to listen to a recording. I can't see that. Heaven's now my home. At the end of the, re at the, end of the, the music, uh, the family will uh, uh, go into the fellowship hall. And then um, at the end of the song, the family will go into the fellowship hall. After we have left, uh, then everybody else can follow. Sorry that I left you I know you feel alone But God told me that he needed me He called me to come home And what seemed to be an instant In the twinkling of an eye An angel gently took my hand and led me toward the sky As I ascended into heaven Beyond the pearly gates Angels were Rejoicing, then I saw his radiant face. God's eyes shone down upon me from the glory of his throne. He said, Enter into paradise.
Cause heaven's now your home, I fought the fight. I finished the race throughout the trial. I kept my faith. No longer do I suffer. My body's been made whole. I'm flying with the angels, and heaven's now my home. God told me not to worry. He said you'd be okay, because eternity's forever, and we'll meet again someday. I fought the fight. I finished the race. Throughout the trial, I kept my faith. No longer do I suffer. My body's been made whole. I'm flying with the angels, and heaven's now my home. I'm flying with the angels. And heaven's now my home.
It has been such a great year for both of these ministries, and it's an honor to get to give our annual report for this year. Starting with the youth group, it has been a year of great connection. Last summer was packed full of incredible experiences and events where we got to gather with the entire church. I just wanted to quickly highlight a couple of these things. We kicked it off with Elevate. Our youth group got to meet up with a thousand other students from the Southwest Field at Point Loma Nazarene University for a weekend full of games and fun and worship together. And it's coming up again soon. We're so excited to go back again. And I wanted to highlight, shout out our quizzers who took second place last year out of the whole field. Congrats, you guys are awesome. Time to come back and win it all this year. Let's go. After that, um, in June, a high school student and I got to go to General Assembly, um, the global gathering of the Church of the Nazarene. It held in Indianapolis every four years. And a student and I got to go as representatives for youth ministry for our whole Southern California district. It was such an exciting, wonderful gathering for the global church of the Nazarene. And then the next month, 10 students and us got to go to Tampa Bay, Florida for Nazarene Youth Conference, um, where we got to gather with 10,000 other high schoolers from all over the USA, Canada region to worship, serve with the local churches, in the area. Wow, what an impressive, incredible experience for us to get to go and worship with the body and realize that we're not alone. And then when we got back a week later, 24 of us went to summer camp with Southern California and Anaheim districts combined. And it was an especially exciting camp because so many of our students reaffirmed that they want to go all in with the Lord. It was an incredible time. I'm just so thankful and I can't wait for summer camp again this year. And then just last month, we got to host a youth rally here at Mission Church that we had over 110 people come to. Good morning, Mission Church. My name is Renata, and it's been my privilege to lead our children this past year. In the work with the kids, I've worked hard to align what I do with the mission statement of our church to authentically love God, humbly serve others, and intentionally share Christ. This past year, we have studied in depth key passages of scripture and how to apply it to their lives as we work on building authentic relationships with the living God. We've studied in depth and memorize key passages of scripture, such as Psalm 23, the Lord's Prayer, the armor of God, and the fruits of the Spirit. I'm proud of the kids for the work they've done to hide God's 